Um, I think we're about to start uh, our mini symposium. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome you to this mini symposium that links Antarctic science with environmental protection and having a unique opportunity to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Madrid Protocol. Actually, it's been quite a busy year on celebrations, uh, particularly in the last Antarctic Treaty Consensus meeting in Chile, that it was quite overwhelming of the success that the Madrid Protocol has been in the last 25 years. But before I start, um, I'd like to thank that uh, not only the invited speakers that kindly accept us to work with us in the last year in planning uh, this mini symposium, but also particularly um, the people that have been working um, quite hard in the last year in planning this mini symposium. Um, Annie Quilmot from, from Belgium, Kevin Hughes from United Kingdom, Gabriel Roland from New Zealand, uh, Daniela Ligit from, um, from New Zealand that have been working with us quite closely, but also the local organiz organizers. It has been a pleasure to be here uh, in Kuala Lumpur and we've been very well uh, welcomed here. Um, we also welcome uh, also our colleagues that have been here, that are here, uh, from the Committee on Environmental Protection and also uh, SCAR SCATS. Uh, actually, it's a privilege that two of the invited speakers uh, is uh, highly involved, Alex, actual uh, active member of SCATS, Stephen Sean led it, and David Walton is around, and he was one of the leaders of SCAR SCATS, the Standing Committee for the Antarctic Treaty System. So thank you very much. Uh, your hard work really paid off in this last year organizing this mini symposium. This mini-symposium was initially planned, is still planned today, for you as Antarctic active uh, scientists, the majority of you. This is our audience. Uh, this was always, since day one, to plan for you, to think why should we link uh, the science that uh, you do uh, into policy making. Um, if you are a scientist in your research group, um, we consider that could be quite a challenge, and still today is. Why should you do it uh, if you haven't done it before? Uh, why is it relevant when you're under pressure every day to publish? Um, or if you don't have guidelines from your uh, research institute, for example? Could be this uh, a good way, for example, if you link your science into policy, to actually giving something back to the community? to reinforce the way we do science, not only today, but influence what it can do in the future in an even improved way to, impact, uh, to minimize the impact that we can have in the environment. Could be this a good way to get a better grant because we have a broader view on the implications on your science, but also have you heard in the last hour how can influence um, uh, the careers of early career scientists. Actually, various talks talked about conservation and led with some repercussions on, um, on policies. But we also thought, as a coordinating committee, we also thought that we also have our peers here from uh, the Commission on Environmental Protection and others that are not scientists. And this uh, mini symposium is also for you. Um, yeah, actually, during this conference, we have various sections that link science into policy. So this is quite a, an, uh, an important um, moment in time that we have today. The Antarctic Treaty, as you know, was signed in 1959 uh, and is recognized as one of the most successful international agreements and is something that we really appreciated. So actually what we do in the Antarctic and the science that we do and the policy that has been doing today uh, has been recognized internationally at the highest level, but still uh, uh, a lot of work to do. And actually, bringing science into policies can be quite a big challenge. The Madrid Protocol, or the Protocol for on um, Environmental Protection to the Antarctic Treaty was signed in 91 and into force in 98, and re reiterated again that Antarctica and recognize it as a natural reserve devoted for, uh, for science and for peace. And by then is when uh, the Committee for Environmental Protection uh, actually starting their work and major, had major implications in the last 25 years. 
in a nutshell, what we're going to learn uh, uh, during these talks is to provide examples for you as a scientist and how can you engage uh, into, uh, into policy, how can you bring your science into policy to learn more about the, the Commission on Environmental Protection and their hard work they've been done in the last 25 years, but also to learn more about this community that actually policy makers are also our friends <laughs> and it can bring science to another dimension. We definitely need to work together more. Uh, just a couple of two notes before we start. Do write the questions that you might have to any of the panelists and even if you don't have time, do please come back to us with your questions. Uh, your input is extremely important to us and this, we hope, uh, while celebrating the 25th Madrid Protocol uh, celebrations, this could be, this mini symposium could be another boost to reinforce these connections between Antarctic science and policy. Thank you so much. Uh, my role is to, uh, to uh, give you the structure of this mini symposium during the two hours that we have. Uh, we will have a short introduction by the president of SCAR, Geronimo Lopez, then uh, six uh, colleagues who are either scientists or policy makers or a mixture of both uh, will shortly present some aspects of their work and of the working of the functioning of the CEP, of the environmental protection. Uh, and then, because this symposium is for you, uh, there will be about one hour of panel discussion. We have microphones in, uh, in the uh, corridors here. And you are really welcome to come and ask questions and uh, yeah, have uh, your opinions or your uh, interrogation expressed and answered. Um, it's because we are also involved in a uh, scientific paper on this uh, initiative, um, we are asked for recording. But uh, if any of you had some objections to it, uh, just tell us and we will delete the part where you were, for example, active. Um, and also this recording will be only used for scientific uh, purposes and uh, we rely on Daniela Liget, um, um, stewardship on uh, the handling of such uh, material. So we follow all the ethical procedures thanks to her. Um, and then uh, please do not forget to answer the survey. Uh, we have put the link on the slide here. But if it's too complicated, just uh, note the email of uh, Gabriella Roland and she will give you access to the survey. So this is part of a, a publication that we want to do concerning the link between uh, science and uh, policy making. Uh, and this is the survey, this, um, this uh, session and also some interviews. Thank you very much. Uh, international Science in Antarctica. The SCAR missions include to provide advice uh, to the Antarctic Treaty system, especially to, through the Antarctic Treaty consultative meetings, and since the protocol exists to the Committee on Environmental Protection. But the SCAR is paying attention to the conservation in Antarctica much before these times of the protocol. And since 1970, it, is, uh, it was in SCAR a subcommittee on conservation. Uh, this was under the working group on biology. Uh, later, it uh, was created a group of specialists on environment and conservation, COSEAC. Uh, and this was the main way to connect with the Antarctic Treaty meetings. Uh, a person that was a key, uh, in a key position in this period and in the early years of the protocol has been David Walton, who is here in this, in this meeting. But when the SCAR structures were reviewed in a big manner in 2002, this was changed, and, and the first years David Walton continued there up to 2005. Uh, in the new uh, subsidiary committee in SCAR, that is uh, the Standing Committee on the Antarctic Treaty System. Since uh, 2005, to 2015, during 10 years, the chair, the head of this uh, important for SCAR 
Standing Committee has been Stephen Chan, who is here, and that has been a period in which the position of SCAR has been very reinforced in, in, in front of the treaty meetings, and SCAR is very uh, appreciate very much the personal contribution of, of Stephen and also all the community that is behind that. And since 2015, the, the place has been occupied by Alex Terot, the, the, who is now the chair of this uh, committee. The, during this time, the uh, SCAR participated, has the status of observer in the Antarctic Treaty meetings and in the CEP meetings is there, same status that has the CONNAP and also CAMLAB. And every year, SCAR present a different number of information papers and working papers, about eight to 12, more or less, the number is not so important, it's more important the real content. And, but every year there is some papers of important content, I, I think. Uh, and SCAR has contributed with, in this period, uh, since the start of the protocol, in many ways. Uh, contributing to the recommendations and the decisions and the, the agreements adopted by the CEP. For instance, in fields like the scientific use of animals, the introduction of non-native species, the collection of meteorites, the impact of noise on mammals. You can see that are not only specifically biological issues, the impact on colonies of different... Sometimes this uh, SCAR contribution is jointly with CONNAP, because some, many times the scientific and operational issues are very, very connected. The last one of these contributions in, the, in this way that sometimes has been in, in the way of, uh, in, in the manner of codes of conduct that has been ad adopted by the, by the CEP or the, the, the TCM has been in the last treaty meeting, last May, uh, was uh, about the activities in geothermal areas. And this was a paper presented by SCAR and adopted like a recommendation by the, by the CEP. Well, I would like only to to comment like, very shortly that this idea of advice to the to the Tati Treaty system and to the in the framework of the protocol is is and I think should continue being um, a priority for, for SCAR. And and I think we are in a very good way. The SCAR position in front of the treaty I think has been very reinforced in, in, in last years and this is very good. And I uh, appreciate that we appreciate very much that the person like the chair of the CEP is here and involved in this municipal portion. The secretary of the Antarctic Treaty is also participating in this meeting. I think uh, it's an excellent signal of that. The same that the chair of CONAP is also here. I think this is an excellent way to push all together in the same direction that is indicated by the protocol and, and I hope this municipal portion is also in, to contribute to this. Thank you very much part of the French delegation at the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meetings since 2003, and he was Vice Chair of the Committee of Environmental Protection, CEP, uh, from uh, 2005 to 2009. He chaired the CEP from 2011 to 2014. He is also the current Vice Chair of the Council of Managers of National Antarctic Programs, COMNA, and member of the Executive Committee of the European Polar Board. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. Good morning, everyone, dear colleague. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank SCAR and the organizer of this mini symposium for the kind invitation uh, to present this, uh, this talk. As you are all well aware, Antarctica is a wide spot uh, from space but under the ice, it's also a huge continent of uh, 14 square kilometers in area. This continent is a very remote place, surrounded by the vast southern ocean. It was also discovered very late, and there were few economic activities after its discovery mainly in the first part of the 20th centuries, uh, activities of sailors and whalers 
both in the subantarctic islands and on the coast of the Antarctic Peninsula. They are, of course, likely mineral resources uh, in Antarctica, but the nature and quantities remain largely unknown. And the last important fact is that we have seven claimant parties, uh, claimant countries uh, in Antarctica. So in 19, uh, sorry, in 1957, 58. Oh, okay, that's good. Uh, in 1957 58, more than 60 countries, 4,000 scientific organizations, and 25,000 scientists were involved in a very special scientific uh, event, uh, the International Geophysics Year. And this uh, event uh, demonstrated the high interest of uh, this region for scientific research. And the uh, IGA, uh, uh, IGY opened the door for the next fundamental step for the future of Antarctica. It created the best condition to make Antarctica a continent dedicated to science. And I recall that at this time, the political situation of the world was very critical with the, uh, the two east and west blocks fronting. So Antarctica appear as like a, a location uh, of the planet where it would be possible to work without such a pressure, political pressure. So uh, the Antarctic Treaty uh, was signed in December 1959 by 12 countries and entered into force in 1961. It is really a unique example of joint international governance, and it has been until now very successful, even if the principle of consensus in decisions prevents quick responses to the current issues in Antarctica. In 2016, uh, the Antarctic community counts uh, 53 signatory states to the Antarctic Treaty, and the most recent being Portugal. And 29 of these parties are consultative parties, meaning that they have voting rights under the treaty. The basis of the treaty is a statu quo regarding the territorial claim. So it's very important uh, for our work in Antarctica today. And uh, the second basis is that this continent is dedicated to peace and science. It means that we have freedom of scientific investigation in Antarctica, freedom in station settlement, scientific station settlement, and the treaty encourages also international cooperation through information exchange, personnel exchange, and scientific observations and research exchange. Following the entry into force of the treaty in 1961, the treaty parties have over time negotiated additional freestanding international agreements. These are the Conservation uh, uh, Antarctic Seals, SECAS. It is the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Raging Resources, uh, CAMLA. We had a convention for the regulation of Antarctic mineral resources activities uh, signed in Wellington in 1988, but this uh, convention was never ratified, so it's not under, into force. And the last is the protocol on environmental protection to the Antarctic Treaty, or so-called Madrid Protocol. And these three ratified uh, elements, uh, so SECAS, CAMA, and uh, the Madrid Protocol constitute what we call the Antarctic Treaty Systems. The environmental protocol was agreed in 1991 following the demise of the negotiated minerals convention. The protocol designated Antarctic, uh, Antarctica as a natural reserve devoted to peace and science, and the reason that Antarctica has such high environmental standards is to ensure that its value as a global scientific laboratory is maintained. 
So, so the protocol on, on, on turned into force in 1998, and it is also important to mention that there is no expiration date for the protocol. Preserving Antarctica's values as a scientific resource is one of the primary purposes of the protocol. This is reflected in Article 3 of the protocol, which states that activities shall be planned and conducted so as to accord priority to scientific research and to preserve the value of Antarctica as an area for the conduct of such research, including research essential to understanding the global environment. To this end, scientific research is necessary to support improved environmental management outcomes. One of the most known articles of the protocol is uh, Article 7, of the prohibition of mineral resource activities. And this article states that any activity relating to mineral resources other than scientific research shall be prohibited. The environmental protocol itself sets out uh, the principles and standards for environmental protection. The more detailed rules are contained in six annexes. The first one on initial environmental evaluation, the second on conservation of Antarctic flora and fauna, the third on waste disposal and waste management, the fourth on prevention of marine uh, pollution, the fifth on area protection and management, and the last one on liability arising from environmental emergencies. But this line one was agreed in 2005, but is not yet ratified. And that's not under into force. The protocol established the Committee for Environmental Protection, the CEP, and the functions of the CEP shall be to provide advice and formulate recommendations to the parties in connection with the implementation of the protocol including the operation of the, its annexes for uh, consideration to the Antarctic Treaty consultative meetings at ICERS. And uh, Article 12 of the protocol lists areas on which the CP should advise the ATCM. This includes the means of minimizing or mitigating environmental impacts of activities in the Antarctic Treaty area the operations and further elaboration of the Antarctic Protected Area Systems, the collection, art giving, exchange, and evaluation of information related to environmental protection, the state of the environment, the Antarctic environment, and the need for scientific research, including environment monitoring related to the implementation to this protocol. There are currently 37 parties which are listed on the slide. And uh, all these parties are uh, entitled to participate in meetings of the CEP. Uh, notably, there are more members uh, of the CEP than there are consultative parties to the treaty, making the committee the largest of all the bodies of the Antarctic Treaty System. There are also three formally designated observers to the committee, uh, the SCAR, uh, Kamla and Kamla, and a number of invited uh, expert bodies. Before uh, giving the floor to Johan Michael, the current chair of the CEP, my last message to you is, yes, science input to CEP work is essential for the protection of the Antarctic. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is the current chair of the CEP, Mr. Ewan McGuire. He was appointed in 2014, but he has worked in a range of environmental management and policy roles with the Australian <coughs> Antarctic Division for more than 14 years. In his senior role, in his role, sorry, as a senior environmental policy advisor for the Australian Antarctic Division. Ewan has been a member of the Australian delegation of the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meetings for a decade and has been Australia's representative to the CEP since 2007. Today he will address us on the status of the Madrid Protocol and the challenges of today. Thank you very much, Gabriella, and I'd like to start uh, by thanking and congratulating our Malaysian hosts for a fantastic event here and also thanking the Mini Symposium Organising Committee and SCAR 
for organising what I think is a very timely uh, and important discussion. In my work, um, I get to work, I have the privilege of working quite close to the Antarctic Policy and Science Interface, so it's a real pleasure for me to have the opportunity to come and immerse myself in the world of Antarctic science um, at these conferences. I'm really taking a lot away um, from the discussions and the presentations here, so thank you also. Well, we've just had a presentation from Eve, who has brought us all up to speed on the background to the Madrid Protocol and also the functions of the Committee for Environmental Protection, which I'll refer to throughout as the CEP. I'll speak about how protecting Antarctica continues to be a focus of international attention and some of the challenges of today with reference to the work and the priorities of the CEP. So regarding the status of the Madrid Protocol, and to begin by stating the obvious, as you've heard, the Madrid Protocol entered into force in 1998. So that means that today there is in place a binding international agreement that seeks to ensure the comprehensive protection of Antarctica as a natural reserve devoted to peace and science. As an up-to-date indication of the Antarctic Treaty Party's support for that objective, it's relevant to refer to the outcomes of the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting held in Santiago earlier this year. And in particular, I make reference to the Santiago Declaration on the 25th anniversary of the Madrid Protocol. And in that de declaration, the parties stated their strong and unwavering support for the objectives and purposes of the Madrid Protocol, including the mining ban, and they also pledged to strengthen, further strengthen their efforts to pre preserve and protect the Antarctic environment. Of particular relevance to the subject of this symposium, the parties also reaffirmed the importance of drawing on the best available scientific information in informing the protection and management of Antarctica. Well, the Santiago Declaration was a fitting way for the parties to mark this significant anniversary, the 25th anniversary of the protocol, but it is worth highlighting that Environmental protection has been the clear focus of discussions at the annual Antarctic Treaty meeting, not just this year, but for the last 25 years. A further indication of the health of the Madrid Protocol can be drawn from the increase in number of states' parties to the protocol, from 26 in 1991 to 37 parties today, as we've just heard from Eve. And there are good indications that this number will continue to grow and on that point, I would just like to take the opportunity to very warmly welcome the announcement made by the Minister last night that Malaysia, um, that the protocol will enter into effect for Malaysia next month. So it will be wonderful to welcome Malaysia as the 38th party to the protocol um, and as a member of the Committee for Environmental Protection. So regarding the status of the protocol, I'd just say in summary, there remains a high level of international support for the Madrid Protocol as the best means of advancing the protection of the Antarctic region. However, despite this strong international commitment, that does not mean that there are any grounds for complacency. Indeed, the establishment of the Committee for Environmental Protection arose from the recognition that the Antarctic Treaty Parties would continue to require expert advice on how best to address ongoing new and emerging environmental challenges facing the Antarctic region. A general challenge for the Committee for Environmental Protection arises from the fact that our knowledge of Antarctica is not complete and the situation is not static. To effectively fulfil its role, the CEP requires a sound understanding of things like what is the state of the Antarctic environment, how, how is it changing and how is it likely to change into the future. How do human activities interact with the environment and what are the consequences of those interactions? And also, how do and what are the environmental implications of pressures arising from activities outside the Antarctic region? To help focus its activities on the most important issues, the CEP has for many years utilised a rolling prioritised five-year work plan. The issues identified in the work plan reflect the, the CEP members' views on the main environmental challenges facing Antarctica. And many of these issues, I've noted, are the subject of discussions and presentations here this week. Now, I don't have time to run through all those issues. You can see in a very broad brush way those issues listed on the screen. 
Um, and if you're interested, you can look at the detail of the work plan, which is um, on the, the URL is provided here on the screen. But I would like to just briefly touch on some of the, the highest priority issues identified by the CEP. And those remain here on the screen. The first of these relates to addressing the risks, of, risks to Antarctic biodiversity associated with non-native species. Now, there's been some good progress made on addressing the risks of species being transported from outside the Antarctic region to Antarctica, and also on the basis of um, excellent research input provided by SCAR. But the committee has an ongoing and forward work program on non-native species that will seek to uh, establish ways to effectively monitor for and respond to species that do become established in Antarctica. Also, to look at effective ways to address risks associated with the transport of species between bioregions in Antarctica and risks associated with marine species introductions. The second issue relates to understanding and addressing the environmental implications of climate change in the Antarctic for the protection and management of the environment. This is the subject of a recently developed CEP climate change response work program. And that work program aims to identify actions to help prepare for and build resilience to the environmental impacts of a changing climate. The SCAR Antarctic Climate Change and Environment Report and the annual updates provided by SCAR to the CEP and the Antarctic Treaty Parties are an excellent and valuable input um, for this work. Thirdly, I'd like to mention that the CEP is uh, undertaking work to support the party's desire to ensure the appropriate management of Antarctic tourism. By better understanding how tourism interacts with the environment and the potential consequences of those interactions. A priority for the CEP's future work in this regard is on developing a practical means of identifying and assessing the sensitivity of sites to tourist visitation, including as a basis for monitoring and possible future management action. And the final priority I'd like to mention is um, the further development of the Antarctic Protected Area System. This relates to a commitment in the protocol to identify and designate protected areas within a systematic environmental geographic framework. And excellent science-based products such as the Environmental Domains Analysis of Antarctica, the Antarctic Conservation Biogeographic Regions, and also the assessment of important bird areas in Antarctica uh, are fundamental resources for the committee's work in this regard. Further engagement with the science community will be essential as we continue to work on these and other challenges because without relevant, timely and high quality scientific information, the committee would clearly lack critical input for the policy making process. Which brings me to my final slide. When the Antarctic Treaty Parties adopted the Madrid Protocol in 1999, they recognised the value of Antarctica as a place for conducting globally significant science. They also recognise the important role of science in informing, in informing the wise management and protection of the Antarctic region. And 25 years on, this is clearly still the case, and increasingly so. SCAR has been, and no doubt will continue to be, an active and varied contributor of high quality scientific advice to the Antarctic Treaty System. And this is where I'd like to end with an advertisement, and that is to encourage any of you who have an interest in this regard um, to come forward and to make further contributions to this work. You'll shortly hear presentations about the scientific, oh, sorry, the Standing Committee on SCAR and the Antarctic Treaty System, which from the CP perspective plays a really important role as the main interface between the Antarctic science community and the Committee for Environmental Protection. You'll also hear about the Antarctic Environments Portal, which is emerging as a valuable source of policy-ready scientific information relevant to the CP's priorities. And finally, I'd just like to say, please do also feel free to contact your national representatives to the CEP. I hope you can see from this slide that they're really quite a friendly bunch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ewan. Our next speaker is Dr. Andrew Constable. Now, I would like to draw your attention because in your um, programs you will see that Dr. Early Costa is listed. Unfortunately, she cannot be here with us today, but in a very, very short notice, Dr. Constable said yes to our invitation. So uh, we would like to publicly thank him for doing this.
Um, Andrew is a quantitative marine ecologist from Australia and he works at the Australian Antarctic Division and has been a program leader at the Antarctic Climate and Ecosystems Cooperative Research Centre since 2005. He is an active participant at the CAMLAR Commission of, for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources and he is currently the Vice Chair Biology of the Southern Ocean Observing System, SUS. In addition, Dr. Constable co-leads the Ocean Carbon and Ecosystems Program, and today he will uh, talk to us about linking Antarctic science and policy from a marine perspective. Thank you. Gabrielle, and good morning, everybody. Uh, it's with great pleasure that I've um, uh, been putting together this uh, talk uh, since being invited, and I'd like to thank the organisers of this mini-symposium um, for inviting me to have a think about um, the link between science and policy uh, from a marine perspective. I've worked for 30 odd years in the Camilla environment uh, and I started at the same time that the, uh, the Minerals Convention was being negotiated and saw the rapid transition to the Madrid Protocol over five years and it was quite an extraordinary period. And science played a fundamental role in that. And what I want to do in this talk is to not just talk about from a marine perspective, but how do you channel science into policy? And to me, the link between science and policy is not the provision of science and then take that up into policy, but it's actually the harmonisation of science and policy. And it's about scientists and policy makers working together to deliver an outcome. And the Antarctic environment is a unique environment because we have to work with consensus. If you look at the map uh, on the bottom right, um, you'll see that this was produced in around, around about 1600. Uh, and Jennifer's talk this morning, she indicated that uh, her model uh, failed because it had the ice sheet extending way out into the Southern Ocean. Well, I think these cartographers got it right in 1600. Uh, and Jennifer, in fact, got it right. And this is a sign of what the, uh, the prehistory uh, size of the ice sheet was and that we are, in fact, experiencing climate change. But it might be just uncertainty in our, in our cartography and the scientific information going within it. So how do we deal with that? So we've heard already from Eve and from Ewan about the Madrid Protocol. And Articles 2 and 3 are essential to think about that from a science perspective. On the map you can see the, uh, the solid yellow line represents the uh, area of the Antarctic Treaty, it's the uh, 60th parallel, uh, and the red lines indicate the 2,000 metre isobath. Most of the interest in the Antarctic Treaty system is in waters shallower than the 2,000 metre isobath. Uh, even the krill fishery concentrates <coughs> in those areas, and so you can see that from a marine perspective, it's only a very small area compared to the entire Southern Ocean that we might be dealing with, and as well as the Antarctic continent. The Camelot area, which was negotiated by the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Parties after CCAS was uh, brought into force, um, it was extended to take account of the polar front. And the dashed line, the dashed yellow line, indicates the extent of the Camelot area. But there is that area of overlap south of 60 degrees south. And when you look at Articles 2 and 3 in the Madrid Protocol, they are, it's a very important part of the Antarctic Treaty System. In the preamble to the Protocol, it actually talks about reaffirming the state of Camelar and the objectives of Camelar. So there is, this, there is this fusion in the marine environment, which goes uh, anywhere that's marine, there is a fusion between the requirements of Camelar and the requirements of the Protocol. And what's really interesting, if you look at the Camelot Convention, in Articles 3 and Articles 5, it indicates that even for uh, countries that are parties to Camelot, but aren't parties to the Antarctic Treaty, they still have to abide by the protection mechanisms that are instituted by the Antarctic Treaty and the Madrid Protocol. And so there is this powerful fusion between those two bodies. And so from a marine perspective, the, the Madrid Protocol has something to offer in managing the marine environment in that area. So what can we do as scientists when we look at Articles 2 and 3 of the Protocol? One of the principles is to limit adverse impacts on ecosystems. What are those types of adverse impacts and how might they be limited? They're good science questions to inform policy. 
There are a number of points that the Antarctic Treaty uh, Consultative Parties needs uh, to avoid, such as de detrimental changes to species or populations, to not cause threatened or endangered species to decline further, and to not degrade areas. How do scientists provide the information so as they uh, can be brought into effect? And then there is also a requirement to monitor, uh, particularly for early warning of adverse effects. Can we stop them from happening? Can we de actually detect those? Can we assess the effects once activities are being undertaken? And can we actually identify when there might be unforeseen effects? These are very important questions from a science perspective in order for the Antarctic Treaty consultative parties to do their business. What's also really important is that this information is needed, according to the protocol, this information is needed prior to activities being undertaken. The activities should be planned and coordinated and undertaken with these ideas in mind. So science has a big role to play right through this process. So what's our challenge? And here I'm going to just whip through a few slides to give you a perspective about how you can deliver science into this policy framework. Our core challenge as scientists in the Antarctic Treaty System is that decisions are based on consensus, they are evidence-based, they'll be based on science, but science itself is founded on scepticism, it's never 100% sure, and for many of us, we might get asked a very important question by a policy maker, maker and we'll say, well, maybe this, maybe that. There is this view over here, maybe you should talk to them too. And so we're never quite certain uh, about what advice we might deliver. And as a result, consensus, which is agreeing to proceed, it may not be full agreement in the proposition, but it's at least agreeing to proceed. How do we actually deliver that, given that there is this debate naturally amongst scientists? Well, I think we can. But there is another challenge that we face. If we move from the top left to the bottom right, the region of interest is the region that managers are interested in. As scientists, we might do ship-based transects or we might go drilling on the ice sheet or something like that, but we might have transects which are a large scale, but they're still only small compared to the region of interest. We then have stations at particular locations or at particular times, and then most of us will spend most of our work analysing the samples. When you try and go back through all of that process, you can see to deliver science into management requires us to upscale the work that we spend most of our time on. And for me as an Antarctic scientist, and I'm sure that you've experienced, we can't do it alone. And I think that's one of the great things about SCAR and the way that it's organised and the Antarctic community is organised, is that we can actually bring scientists together to address the big questions even though our own science is only at a small scale relative to those management questions. So how do we link science and policy? I want to just walk you through this so don't be disturbed by the number of boxes in the flowchart, but it does show, uh, this eventually will show the links between science and policy. That top line is the overall objectives that we see written into conventions. On the left you'll see that um, what we're seeking in the Madrid Protocol and in Camilla is the conservation uh, and protection and on the right we can see that there is some idea of strategic processes for mitigation, avoidance and adaptation. And if you like, it's the CEP and the IPCC. And what they're interested in is what's the state now, what's the state likely to be, and what are the gaps in knowledge that are important for trying to see our way clear. Science plays a number of roles. How do you assess status and how do you model the future? Uh, and I thought Rob this morning showed the importance of getting good models for looking to the future, and even though they may be uncertain, um, they're really important uh, to take account of. I'm not going to go into that in further detail, but I'm quite happy to provide that uh, for further discussion. So just in the last couple of minutes, I just want to give you some examples. Tourism and predator colonies. What do we need to do as scientists? Tourists go there, penguins change their behaviour. Do they? Good question. How do we manage that interaction between tourists and the colonies? In the long term, though, what's going to happen to the colonies as a result of tourism? Uh, and I thought Jamie this morning articulated very nicely how developing models to better understand colony dynamics is going to be really important for being able to look at the effects of people on them. 
And in the end, we need to about, know about, well, what are the long-term trends in abundance? So we should be monitoring those as well. Protected areas is a really important case. Um, I show here the, uh, the uh, boundaries of the proposed East Antarctic representative system of marine protected areas. And these areas were designed as reference areas as well as important areas for conservation in which there would be um, careful management of fishing and research activities. You see more recent study by Ben Raymond and his co-workers um, shows the importance of different foraging habitats and those areas are important for predators and they allow us then to be able to monitor change if we can set them up as reference areas. So they are important roles, not only protection but also being able to tell us about the future. The big question that we face right now is, well, what's the current state of the ecosystem? We've heard about different states, so there's the krill-based system and the fish-based system, and Rowan talked about that this morning, uh, and they will depend on the environmental states uh, and then the, own, uh, and the relative abundance and relative importance of species will vary accordingly. But we don't know where the system is now. Uh, one of the things that uh, a number of us are discussing at this meeting is about benchmarking the Southern Ocean ecosystem so as we can identify what is the current state of the whole of the Antarctic and Southern Ocean marine system. And then can we develop plausible ecosystem models uh, then to start to tell us about what the consequences of change are and the consequences of human activities. So just to recap quickly, science has a very important role to play in policy and decision making. And scientists need to be able to harmonise their work and be able to work together to be able to provide the best outcomes in a policy setting. Uh, that's the key question and I think that if you would like to see more about what questions that scientists might ask with respect to the Madrid Protocol, I encourage you to read Article 3 of the Protocol because it's a very important part of the system. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Our next speaker is Birgit Nierstad. Bridget is the head of the environmental management sector at the Norwegian Polar Institute based in Tromsø. She holds national and international responsibilities within the field of the Antarctic management and policy development and has been responsible for and contributor to a number of studies and assessments related to the Arctic and Antarctic environmental management. Bridget represents Norway at CEP and is also a published author in this field. Now, we had the pleasure of having Bridget in New Zealand visiting us when she was working as a project manager of the Antarctic Environmental Portal, and today she will talk to us about her expertise in this particular project. Thank you, Gabriella, for that, and thank you to the organizers for, uh, for this mini-symposium. As the other speakers, I believe this is a very important uh, opportunity for us to interact between scientists and policymakers and it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you. Um, and I guess I also should say good afternoon. Now we have moved into the afternoon session of today. So I'm here today uh, to let you know why and how you can and should give your research policy impact. And in the nine minutes that I have been provided uh, for this purpose, um, I will briefly introduce you to and remind you about the Antarctic Environments Portal as an interface tool between science and policy. I'll also say a few words about the motivation um, behind evidence-based policy making. I'll flag some challenges that we're facing in this regard, and I'll then come back to highlighting the portal's role as, a sol as maybe one solution, not the solution, uh, to this, um, this uh, effect. So, to talk about the portal, which is the title, really, of uh, my talk, um, let me um, just run through some of the basics of, uh, of it. The Antarctic Environments Portal was formally launched in 2015, so only one year ago, after having been developed over a number of years on an initiative from New Zealand. The Antarctic Environments Portal is a web-based available source of defensible information on environmental issues targeted at managers and policymakers. In particular, it tar targets the members of the Committee for Environmental Protection, the CEP, as we've heard about, and the Antarctic Treaty uh, parties. The portal aims to close the increasingly growing gap between the scientific knowledge and masses of it 
on the one hand and the policy making on the other. The portal consists of short articles on a variety of management relevant uh, topics. And I think when you go into the portal and look there, you'll see a number of those issues that Ewan pointed to in his talk about the CP priority issues. You will see these reflected in the topic uh, list in the portal today. The articles in the portal conform to a prescribed style, are apolitical, contain no recommendations, and aim to provide an accurate representation of the current state of knowledge contained in the peer-reviewed literature on the topic in question. The content is developed by key scientific experts and is subject to a robust editorial process. I said, even though this is a uh, topic of my topic, I mean, the uh, uh, theme of my topic, time does not allow me to go into the details of the portal, but I urge you to visit environments.aq and note that address, environments.aq, and take some time to explore the portal and its content if you have not done so already. And if you have, you might want to do it again. It's uh, evolving constantly. I would, however, like to stress that the Antarctic Treaty Parties have recognized the portal as an impo important source of scientific information. They have also requested that SCAR use the portal actively to provide scientific advice to the parties and have furthermore encouraged all scientists to participate in preparation and review of articles for the portal. And all this you can find back in resolution three of the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting of 2015, one year ago. So why is it that it's so important to make science accessible to the policymakers? Uh, I'll just start by saying that policymaking is simply put, and we could talk about hours about this as well, but simply put, it's the effort to develop policies which serve to promote an overarching aim. In the Antarctic context, the environmental protocol, which we are celebrating here today and we have talked about, constitutes the framework for the development of environmental policies, setting overarching goals and directing actions towards protection and conservation. There are, of course, other drivers and interests that frame policy development in Antarctica as well, uh, but I'm not going to dwell or go into details of these today. Policies should and are normally developed on basis of a broad analysis and assessment of all available and relevant information. It is important to note in this context that it has over the last decades become more and more important to build environmental policies upon a foundation of a solid and robust systematic review of scientific evidence rather than on perceived knowledge and the precautionary principle only. There's not a, a two different things, but uh, there's a, a shift uh, towards even more um, uh, standing on the evidence itself to make them, the decisions more robust in, uh, in making. That scientific evidence plays such a key role in Antarctic policy making is not only a flashy thought or wishful thinking but it is clearly stipulated as a prerequisite in the environmental protocol, I would argue. The protocol, in fact, specifically invites the science community to contribute to the shaping of Antarctic environmental policies, as well as request the policy shapers to, use, to, make, to make use of such contributions. And I refer here to Article 12.2, which you can see on the screen, and 12, Article 12 has been up on the screen earlier today as well. SCAR in particular plays an important role in putting forward a scientific basis for the policy deliberations. We've heard that already stated by other speakers, and I'm sure you'll hear more about it from Stephen and Alex as they take the floor after me. There's a vast and increasing amount of research being undertaken in Antarctica, but I'd argue that neither the individual members of the CEP, the committee itself, nor SCAR really have the sufficient organizational means to carry out in-depth analysis of the scientific basic for all issues that are, are and have been under discussion by policymakers. A strong interface between science and policy will, however, be even more essential for future decision making as activities in Antarctica increase and diversify. So that is, as Antarctic conservation becomes more and more complex, 
the more important it is to ensure the best possible foundation to build policies upon. Collecting and understanding the scientific evidence is not a straightforward task. From the policy-making side of, of things, the difficulties can possibly be summarized in the four overarching points that I have put up on the slide here. I cannot, again, I could probably talk for hours about this, but very shortly. Firstly, knowledge and understanding is normally produced as pieces of a puzzle in which seemingly similar studies may contain hard to see nuances of importance. Findings from different studies may seem to contradict each other. Results may be very loca location or region specific. Now this is looking from a policymaker's uh, side, looking into the research results. Secondly, there's a constant production of new pieces to the puzzle. You can see that my pictures actually make sense if you listen to my words here. Uh, so there's a constant production of new pieces to the puzzle and the rate of production is increasing. The total amount of available information is becoming incredibly large. Thirdly, the detailed, specific and complex scientific publications that put forward the results, so scientific articles, are rarely readily or easily understood by non-experts. And in this case, policymakers are non-experts. They're experts in their field. In short, to see the management needs and in order to be efficient in the decision-making process, policymakers need easy access to the full picture. When flipping the coin, we might notice that, in general terms, science aims to produce more and more accurate explanation as to how the natural world works, and increasing our knowledge base is by definition a step-by-step -step process, in which we constantly close in on the knowledge gaps that rarely complete the picture fully. There is little professional incentive to communicate science to other user groups than the science community itself. And furthermore, there's a fear that the evidence provided by the scientists is used in a manner which might be considered haphazardous from a science viewpoint, where, for example, uncertainties and important details are ignored. And I think Andrew sort of pointed to some of those uh, issues uh, in his talk uh, just recently. So that gets me back to the Antarctic Environmental Portal. The portal, in fact, aims to meet and resolve some of the challenges and obstacles as perceived both by the policymakers and the scientists. It synthesizes current understanding and puts forth a fuller picture of selected priority issues and thereby gives policymakers easy access to scientific evidence in a format that can be readily used for the purpose of policy and management. The portal summary articles are authored by key scientists in the field, that's you guys, ensuring that the most important details are included. Furthermore, efforts are made to ensure that the articles are referable. They have been providing DOI uh, uh, indications on them and so on. And in due course, we'll also find ways to uh, show how the articles actually have impact on policy making. So to summarize, and I know this is very short for actually trying to present the portal, but to summarize, harnessing scientific knowledge to support and inform policy shaping is essential for sound and robust management decisions. The knowledge and skill to effectively engage with policy and decision makers is an art in itself. The packaging of the evidence is an important yet surprisingly dif difficult aspect of the art. But here is where the Antarctic Environments Portal comes in, because it provides the scientific community with a ready-to-use and efficient scientifically sound mechanism for presenting and packaging scientific evidence to the policy and management community. The portal provides the policymakers with an easy access information platform for use in the Antarctic decision-making context. So maybe the crux of what I'm saying then it's a collaborative and concerted effort between the science community and the policymakers towards, towards an expanded use of the portal will over time be bound to have substantial impact on the way and manner in which the Antarctic environment's policies are shaped and implemented. And I believe this can only be for the good of the future Antarctica. So my message to you all is to go home, not right now, but soon. Um, See how you can contribute to the portal, 
you have gotten a pamphlet in your package, uh, in your bag, and you're uh, registered for the meeting, it says, you know, I have an idea for the portal. Look at it, provide your input, and, and contribute, uh, and let's do it together. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Professor Stephen Chow. Uh, Professor Chow is the head of the School of Biological Sciences at Monash University in Australia. In addition to his work in the fields of microecology, evolutionary physiology, and invasion biology, Stephen has been heavily involved in both science and conservation policy development for the Antarctic region as a SCAR representative to the CEP. His professional achievements have been internationally recognized. In 2014, Stephen was awarded the SCAR Medal for Excellence in Antarctic Research. In 2009, he was the Marta T. News Prize and the Zoological Society of Southern Africa Gold Medal, as well as receiving the South African Antarctic Gold Medal. Thank you, Gabriella, for that kind introduction. Thank you to uh, Jose and the committee for inviting me to participate in this really interesting and timely symposium, and to our Malaysian hosts for uh, an excellent meeting and a fantastic icebreaker last night, which was, was exceptionally enjoyable. Now, I've slightly deviated from the title that Jose gave me. I didn't warn him, knowing that he would give me a very stern talking to if he knew in advance. But the Standing Committee on the Antarctic Treaty System in SCAR is just a mechanism for the advice of SCAR to reach the Antarctic Treaty System's members. So it's, the, it's actually SCAR that provides the advice through a mechanism, and in so doing I say it's SCAR's members, because SCAR is only as strong as its members. And so what I would like to share with you this afternoon is simply a few examples of how this can be done, um, how it operates from inside SCAR rather than from an external perspective, and just a few examples of some impact that SCAR has had in the policy setting. So I'm going to talk about just a few points. The first is that SCAR actually provides solicited advice. The treaty system may say, we want to know about something. It also provides unsolicited advice. In other words, something comes up from the science community that this is really important. We think it has huge policy implications. And the decision makers and policy makers really need to think hard about what the science is saying. All of this has to be based, as Birgit very clearly pointed out, and you and before her, on a sound evidence base. Increasingly, that involves some form of systematic review or meta-analysis because of the sheer size and scope of the literature. And indeed, SCAR has to follow the kind of gold standard that the world has set in place in terms of systematic review. And our interest in participating is because it's in SCAR's vision to provide this advice. It's part of why we exist as an organization and also in our own personal interests, and where these two align, we have the very best outcome. In other words, we want to, as individuals, see to an improvement and an advance in environmental protection based on sound evidence. So you've seen a few quotes. This one's actually from the very first meeting of the uh, treaty parties in 1961. I've just pulled out one of the recommendations that highlights that SCAR's really been encouraged to continue with its advisory work. So that's from the earliest days of the treaties it has been recognized that SCAR is really important. So we have essentially a mandate to work from. You've seen this now for the third time in the protocol. There's again this reiteration of SCAR really plays an important role. So let's think about some solicited advice examples. The Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants came to the treaty and said, so what's happening in Antarctica? What's the status? The treaty, in turn, asked the CEP for advice on what's happening. The CEP, in turn, asked SCAR for advice on what's happening. And SCAR, in turn, said, oh, we have some people that are really, really good in this area. We'll ask them to provide us an update. And that's exactly how it worked. We turned to the community and said, who's in this area? Can you provide us with an update? A fantastic report was produced. It was put into the CEP. And, of course, we will be able to uh, offer advice which was then fed back to the Stockholm Convention. We've also, as an organization, been repeatedly asked about bioprospecting. 
Netherlands and Belgium and the United Nations University put together a really interesting list of bioprospecting and patents and so on that have been produced on the basis of Antarctic organisms. Sky's been asked for further advice. What kinds of research has been done? Who's doing the research? What's the extent? And we've responded by providing information in this area. And finally, we've also been asked about wildlife disturbance, and, and Andrew raised that very clearly, that there's all sorts of interesting and new scientific means to provide feedback on wildlife disturbance, not only from tourism, but also from our own activities. So these are examples of classic solicited advice. We get asked a question and we respond. Of course, Sky is quite a small organisation, so it doesn't necessarily respond to every request for advice, because there's some that we simply can't cope with, and I think that's an important thing for the community. Because we have to also be able to say, we can't handle it this at the moment, or the evidence is actually not strong enough to provide you with any clear advice just at the moment. Southern Giant Petrels is a, is a good example of a request for advice, where in about 2006, the uh, Committee for Environmental Protection was thinking about specially protected species and, and, and identified Southern Giant Petrel. Turns out that there weren't that many accumulated data, so SCAR held a meeting in 2008, and in the same year reported back. The key point of this example is that SCAR actually reached out to a number of other organizations, such as BirdLife International, and said, can you help us with an IUCN red list type assessment? Can you help us gather the data? And then we spoke to the community and said, bring your data. In this instance, much of that data weren't actually published. We knew that, but the treaty was pressing us for an answer. And, in fact, the workshop was held. Uh, an independent person led it. That was Stuart Butchart from BirdLife International. And we were able to feed some advice back into the treaty system. And in 2009, the agreement on the conservation of albatrosses and petrels reiterated one of SCAR's key findings, which was that we didn't have sufficient evidence yet to give a good idea of trends. We might have had a good idea on status, but not such a good idea on trends. What we have to think as a community is how has that fed back into our science funding? Because we're not only a group that provides advice, we're also a group of scientists that talks to our funding agencies about key areas of significance. And I think here, as a scientist talking back to the policy makers, because of course we can do so, uh, that link between some of the advice that's coming through and the higher level policies in the treaty and then the way funding is dispersed nationally is a link that perhaps needs some more thought into the future. What about unsolicited advice? Well, I think David Walton was very good at giving unsolicited advice throughout his tenure. And one of the key areas that he identified was that to identify specially protected species in fact, the CEP could look to the IUCN's red list process and learn from it. That was a piece of unsolicited advice that worked very, very effectively and was taken up. Non-native species was a very curious blend of both solicited and unsolicited advice and has had tremendous impact in the treaty system in terms of policy reform that's taken place and, in fact, on-the-ground action through the Council of Managers of National Antarctic Programs. And of course we've heard of environmental change and change impacts. And this is a key area where SCAR's ACCE report actually went into the treaty and as a consequence we had a special meeting of the treaty uh, parties which then came up with a climate change strategy as to what could be done and what resources were required for it. Key to SCAR's activity here is that SCAR's vision, its strategic plan, actually says that we should identify issues emerging from greater scientific understanding and bring them to the attention of policy makers. And I think for us that's very important as a community, that if we think something's important, we should step forward and say, we need to pay attention to this. I'll give you an example. In the current... Um, uh, or at least the past CEP meeting, I had a discussion with some colleagues that were present and I hope I haven't misrepresented what was actually somebody talking to me about what one of the statements was, and that was that there was real interest in the Ross seal. Now, the Ross seal is an interesting species. As far as I could work out from a quick look through the literature, is there's been um, most of the evidence on its numbers come from the Antarctic pack ice seal survey, which was some time ago, and some genetic work. Yet we know that there's interest coming in the species. 
So as a community, we should already be thinking, all of the great things we hear about satellite censusing and so on, how applicable are they? Are they actually applicable? Can we give an answer back saying this is possible or not? And that evidence can only come from ourselves. A further example I have is one that perhaps will sit less well with many of the policy makers. Again, from the recommendation um, 1.5, which was the 1961 meeting, it was suggested that, that SCAR and the treaty parties and others make friends with those around the world to provide better evidence. And so I've been thinking a lot about this recently as to how can we actually make this work from SCAR's perspective? Who should we be um, making friends with, learning from their procedures, and actually fitting into to global views? With a group of colleagues, we then came up with the idea that um, actually, did we know that the current decade is the decade of biodiversity? This is a United Nations Environment Program Convention on Biological Diversity initiative. So by 2020, a report will come out on the status of global biodiversity. How are we doing? Now, the UN produces, or the CBD produces, global biodiversity outlooks. They say very little about Antarctica. And there are good reasons for that, because the mechanisms are set up in a slightly different way. So we asked, well, should we be thinking about this? Does it have any relevance? And as soon as you look at the 20 Aichi targets that are part of the CBD strategic plan, you can immediately see connections. Sustainable management of marine living resources. We see immediately a connection to Kamalala. Pollution reduced. What about Annex 4, marine pollution of the protocol? Protected areas increased and improved. Well, that goes to Annex 5. So they're very, very clear linkages. And the question is, are we feeding the information out so that when the world decides in 2020 how things are looking for biodiversity globally, does it also have an answer that we as a community have put forward? So stepping up to our international and global responsibilities. And those icons at the bottom of the screen, the five little icons, are those used by GBO for just to decide globally, based on a very substantial synthesis of evidence, how things are going. Now this work has just been completed by a huge group of colleagues funded by uh, the Monaco government, SCAR, uh, and um, my institution, Monash, together, and I'll give you a brief glimpse. On strategic goals D and E, which are, are listed, as you can see there, uh, from 14 to 20, and Antarctica is in blue, and the rest of the world's assessment is in red, and the asterisks indicate um, uncertainty, with um, three asterisks re indicating fairly substantial certainty, and less than that, uh, increasing declining certainty. Actually, things aren't looking that good for the region. We have a huge pile of evidence that was compiled, that was done through an expert elicitation and a process of synthesizing the published available evidence, and that's not looking too good. Overall, and we put this out, it's, this is clipped out of the SCAR website, um, the biodiversity outlook based on this basis for the Southern Ocean Antarctica appears to be no better than for the rest of the world. And if you're an optimist, it's no worse than the rest of the world. Key, though, because a fair number of people who saw this were quite negative in their perspective, was that actually the opportunities to improve things are just tremendous. This is a small community. We have a very direct link to the policy world. And I think from a SCAR perspective, that's a key message that I want to leave with you today, is actually we have one of the easiest science to policy transitions that exists given the scope of international organizations elsewhere. We really are able to do so. In fact, we're doing so in this room. We have people sitting here asking, how can it be done? And what are the mechanisms from each side? How do we bridge the language barrier that's so typical of science policy interfaces? So just to, to leave you with the key messages again, we provide both solicited and unsolicited advice. It has to be evidence-based. We have to facilitate science. That's SCAR's role, but that science also feeds into policy. The advantage is we can really provide four major advances in environmental protection. And for individuals, there are real opportunities to have an impact. Many, many people in the science world today, and especially at Monash, many of our students say, we only want to do science that has some opportunity to deliver an improvement to conditions in the world. SCAR offers that opportunity, and it does so through our participation and the mechanism of the Standing Committee. I'd like to thank a few colleagues. 
a few funders and yourselves for your attention. Spatial Ecologist at the Australian Antarctic Division where he is a Senior Research Scientist and Section Head of the Biodiversity Conservation Section. Alex is also an adjunct senior fellow at the Finner School of Environmental and Society of the Australian National University. Presented this mini symposium. The title of my talk is uh, again, I've changed it slightly from uh, what Jose asked me to do, but, but really it's, it's covering the same key aspects. Path to impact. How can scientists influence Antarctic policy? Now I look around this room and I see a number of Antarctic scientists who have used very high quality science to make a successful transition into policy change. But I also look around and I see probably an equal number of people for whom that pathway isn't as clear. So I'm going to step back from the detail a little bit in my presentation. I'm going to talk about some broad ideas that my colleagues and myself have used as we try our very hardest to use science to influence Antarctic policy. And the first thing that I'd like to talk about is passion. Passion drives a lot of the work that we do in Antarctica. Why else would we go down and spend time away from our loved ones in harsh, cold environments if we weren't passionate about what we do? Now, some of the most successful science into policy transitions that I'm aware of have started with a passionate person or a group of passionate people. So it's hard to overstate the importance of being passionate about what you do if your burning desire is to make policy change in Antarctica. Don't work on aspects of Antarctic science that are going to improve your H index. If you have a burning desire to change Antarctic policy, work on something that you're passionate about. And people are passionate about a whole range of aspects of Antarctica. We have people passionate about penguins, springtails, rocks, all sorts of aspects of the, most, the terrestrial and the marine environments. And it's these ecosystems, these aspects, that we can work on, increase our understanding, and influence policy change. Another really important aspect of influencing Antarctic policy is identifying priorities. Now, every, more or less, every organisation has priority areas. There are national priorities. What's important to your country? Now, if you can talk to your policy makers, communicate with them effectively, and I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly, understand the priorities, <laughs> link that perhaps to what you're passionate about, you're off to a really good start. And the, start, and the same at an interna international level. What's important to the treaty? You can really clearly articulate what's important to the CEP. Again, that's a great starting point where you could target your research if you want to make a difference in Antarctic policy. As Stephen so clearly pointed out, SCAR is also a great place to start. The SCAR scientific research programs, for example, have implementation plans. There's some real, there's, for ones like Antico, for example, there's some real clear guidance in terms of some research priorities that you could work within and affect policy change. Priorities aren't the be-all and end-all of this, however. As a number of our, uh, my fellow speakers have pointed out, emerging issues can also be really important. And again, SCAR's a great place to bring these emerging issues, increase their profile, and then bring them to the instruments of the Antarctic Treaty and affect policy change. Now, communication may seem like a no-brainer. And, and to be honest, it's one of the key elements of getting your good quality science into the policy arena and affecting change. Now, scientists and policy makers aren't quite as different, quite as different to each other as this salvage albatross and a red-crested penguin. There's no doubt that there's some good communication happening in several parts of the world between policy makers and scientists. And there's also no doubt that in other parts of the world this communication could be improved. Communicating with your policy makers is a key element of success in transitioning your science into policy successfully. And this can happen at multiple levels, as I just said, happening at the national level, but also at the international level, engaging other countries in your research. If it's not possible to undertake multinational research, disseminate your findings as widely as you can. Engage with other countries after the fact. Engage with other countries 
researchers engage with other countries' policy makers. The more engagement, the more communication that you have at national and international levels prior to trying to achieve policy change, the more successful you are likely to be in making that transition. Publishing can be one of the most effective ways of communicating your research findings. Now this is a challenge. This is a challenge for those of us in government agencies, for example, where publishing your research may not be the highest priority. But nevertheless, it's hard to think of a stronger evidence base for policy recommendations than publishing your work in a high quality scientific journal. It has the added advantage of being independently assessed and through this submission, review and publishing process, it's more than likely that your work has been improved. Publishing in good quality journals also allows the wider dissemination of your research. It makes it in many cases more accessible, even to the point of getting beyond the Antarctic community for which many of us are focused. Getting that sort of dissemination, getting that sort of profile to, to that sort of level can be a key element in making policymakers sit up and take notice of what you're doing. My fellow speakers have done an excellent job of talking about the Antarctic Treaty System. We have a real advantage as Antarctic scientists because we actually have the Antarctic Treaty System. The protocol on environmental protection to the Antarctic Treaty System is quite specific about mechanisms for conserving and protecting Antarctica. You need to take advantage of this explicit, these explicit directions. The protocol gives us such clear guidance on so many aspects of potential research interest that it really does put us in a good position to hit the ground running in terms of affecting policy change. In my mind, the CEP and CAMELA are really the powerhouses of the treaty. They have the capacity to both generate and implement change. And engaging with these, these organisations, these instruments of the treaty, are exceptionally important in the transition from high quality science to policy change. The other thing that I'd like to note about engaging with these bodies is that it is super, super important to have clear objectives and realistic expectations. This can be, these sorts of expectations can be tempered or they can, they can be, uh, if you like, um, worked out by engagement and communication prior to, the, prior to coming to these bodies. And, it, and that's one of the big advantages of that sort of prior engagement, is understanding what people are likely to be ready to accept. As Andrew clearly pointed out, it's a consensus system. Everybody, every single party has to agree. And for this to happen, you really need to make a convincing case. And finally, I'd just like to talk about the pathway, how to engage with these, with these bodies. So you can do it nationally. Talk to your policy makers, understand what their priorities are, how do these link in with, with, with what you're interested in, and try and work with them to take stuff, in, to take your work into the CEP, or, or CAMLA for that matter. Now one of the advantages of doing this is that they can help you to distill what may be not quite as accessible, as, as Birgit pointed out, in a scientific article, into a working paper or some other form of, uh, of input that can actually be understood by policymakers. SCAR provides you with a number of avenues of also, a, a number of, of ways of, of, of getting into these, these bodies, if you like. In particular, though, the Standing Committee to the Antarctic Treaty System, its main role is doing this. And so we're very supportive of, of this type of research, but we're also very supportive of hearing about emerging issues, as Stephen pointed out. We're very keen to hear about what you think is important. And we have the capacity, as an observer to the, Antar to the CEP, to bring these sorts of research ideas and findings to the Antarctic Treaty and hopefully facilitate policy change. The Antarctic Environments Portal is also another aspect, another initiative, I should say, that can be a very effective way of providing policy-ready science to a, to a range of policy makers. So I think I've probably used up the short time that's been allocated to, to me today, and I hope that I've given you at least a couple of ideas, especially those of you who, for whom the pathway to policy change wasn't as clear, as to how you might effectively make the transition from, from your science into policy change. 
I thank you for your attention.